Cardiocerebral Resuscitation, Part 2. The goals and objectives of this module are to identify patients in cardiopulmonary arrest, to initiate effective hospital-based resuscitation care, to discuss appropriate use of chest compressions during defibrillation, and to reinforce the goal of high compression fraction. Defibrillation during resuscitation has very specific indications, including the cardiac rhythms of ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia. One must prime a fibrillating heart with chest compressions prior to defibrillation, especially in those arrest states that have lasted longer than four to five minutes. Please note that the priming effect does decay quickly, and thus it is important to maintain compressions throughout the charge up to the very last moment before the delivery of shock. After defibrillation, immediately resume compressions to encourage a viable rhythm. The most effective antiarrhythmic for persistent and recurrent ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia includes several minutes of chest compressions and early vasopressors. In a witnessed arrest, rapid defibrillation is the number one priority. This includes monitored ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia arrests. The closest responding provider should initiate compressions and call for the defibrillator. Once the defibrillator arrives, shock immediately and consider stacked shocks that is, a sequential delivery of three shocks at 200 joules each on a biphasic defibrillator. Ensure minimal pauses between these shocks and continue the compressions during each charge. In an unwitnessed arrest, that is, those that are lasting more than four to five minutes since arrest or any arrest in an unmonitored setting, confirm the arrest date and immediately start compressions. One must prime the pump with compressions prior to shock. Activate a code blue and wait for the defibrillator. If chest compressions have already been performed for several minutes when the defibrillator arrives, then shock immediately. Otherwise, prime the pump with two to three minutes of compressions prior to the first defibrillation attempt. Biphasic defibrillators are more effective in terminating ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia at a lower energy setting. Be sure to minimize pauses and compressions before and after each shock. Always use the unsynchronized defibrillation setting in both ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia, and consider stack shocks, that is, a sequential delivery of three shocks at 200 joules to maximize the possibility of rhythm conversion. If ventricular fibrillation is a secondary rhythm, that is, the first rhythm was not a shockable rhythm, then immediate defibrillation has a poor prognosis. In this case, two minutes of compressions with early pressor administration should be administered prior to defibrillation attempt. In the following video, you will see a defibrillation shock delivered during continuous chest compressions. Patient is still in V-fib. Uh, you're doing great CPR. We're going to keep it up and uh, get ready to defibrillate. Uh, anesthesia, just keep bagging throughout the process. Don't worry, you're not going to get shocked. I want you to stay on the chest and keep doing those good quality chest compressions. Let's go ahead and charge the defibrillator. The 200, everybody else that is uh, not doing active CPR, back away. Wait for my uh, all clear. I'm going to count down, and then we're going to shock. All clear. Three, two, one, shock. Back on the chest. Good. Many drugs can be used during a resuscitation. Give a vasopressor as soon as possible after starting chest compressions to maximize rhythm conversion. Vasopressin 40 units IV or IO push can be used as the first or second dose to replace epinephrine. However, there is questionable benefit with repeat dosing. Epinephrine 1 mg IV or IO push may be used every 3 to 5 minutes during the resuscitation. However, its response may not be adequate in severe acidemia. If a rapid rate is persistent, you may give amiodarone 300 mg IV or IO push and you may repeat this at a lower dose of 150 mg IV IO push. Amiodarone should be used after two to three unsuccessful defibrillation attempts. Again, chest compressions and early vasopressor delivery is the most effective antiarrhythmic. Atropine should only be given with a suspected vagal event at a dose of one mg IV or IO push. There are several scenarios in which this should be considered. In particular, an ICU patient on several drips that loses their pulses when being transferred to a gurney or rolled for care, or a patient using the restroom on their own for the very first time after a prolonged bed rest. You can also consider using atropine in a patient with a slow heart rate less than 60 that is refractory to epinephrine. However, the response is variable in this situation.
Ventilation should also be performed during resuscitation. However, if there is a lone rescuer responding to an arrest state, the rescuer should perform continuous compressions rather than ventilations. Once additional help arrives, ventilations may be initiated with a bag valve mask. Evidence currently points towards lower oxygen requirements during the arrest state and thus the emphasis on continuous chest compressions. Additionally, positive pressure ventilation can impede cardiac output and venous return to the heart. Asynchronous ventilation should be performed during continuous chest compressions. Tidal volume ventilation should be delivered asynchronously every 5 to 6 seconds during chest compressions. The timing of this ventilation should be during chest recoil in order to reduce the impedance on venous return. Bag valve mask technique should be a true person technique with a two thumbs up approach. Use nasopharyngeal adjuncts and oral pharyngeal adjuncts whenever possible. A third person may also apply cricoid pressure to minimize gastric insufflation of air during ventilations. Avoid a pause for intubation during continuous chest compressions. After the endotracheal tube has been placed, continue ventilatory breaths every five to six seconds. Also place an inline end tidal CO2 detector as soon as possible between the mask and the bag or between the endotracheal tube and the bag. Quantitative end tidal CO2 can be used to confirm the endotracheal tube placement as well as monitor cardiac output during the resuscitation. A goal end tidal CO2 of greater than 10 millimeters of mercury indicates good CPR and can determine perfusion status. It can also guide ventilation following return of spontaneous circulation. If your end tidal CO2 plummets more than 10 millimeters of mercury in 10 seconds, then assume the arrest state and resume chest compressions. Return of spontaneous circulation can be assessed in many ways. Some models of defibrillators have filtering capabilities to filter the artifact of chest compressions and demonstrate the underlying cardiac rhythm. However, this is not currently available at UC Davis Medical Center. Therefore, maintain continuous chest compressions until return of spontaneous circulation is suspected. Return of spontaneous circulation can be suspected when one sees a rise in end tidal CO2 greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. A value less than 20 is unlikely to be associated with the return of spontaneous circulation. Values greater than 30 are more predictive, but can get this high with high quality CPR. Throughout chest compressions, continue slow ventilations every 5 to 6 seconds asynchronously. When assessing for return of spontaneous circulation, you may use brief pauses in chest compressions of less than 10 seconds to check for perfusion. Check central pulses, including the carotid or femoral pulse, and be sure to palpate these pulses prior to stopping compressions. You should also see organized complexes at a rate of 30 per minute or greater on the monitor. Be sure that these pulses correlate with the cardiac complexes. Additionally, you can use pulse oximetry or arterial line waveforms to see if complexes correlate with pulses. Obtain a blood pressure once pulses are confirmed. There are no absolute rules to dictate the cessation of resuscitation. Usually, resuscitation can be stopped once a DNR is confirmed or a surrogate decision maker is present to make this request. An end tidal CO2 of less than 12 millimeters of mercury, despite good CPR, suggests non viability. Achieve consensus with the resuscitation team and family prior to cessation of efforts. Post arrest care has the goals of preventing re arrest and mitigating reperfusion injury. One must maintain perfusion and oxygenation to the patient after return of spontaneous circulation. The target end tidal CO2 should be 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury. Note that you may have a brief elevation of end tidal CO2 representing the washout phenomenon immediately after return of spontaneous circulation. Utilize pressors and fluids for any hypotension less than 70 millimeters of mercury. To mitigate reperfusion injury, all patients with return of spontaneous circulation should be considered for the hypothermia cooling protocol, the purpose of which is to reduce cellular oxygen demand and energy requirements. However, literature currently supports the use of hypothermia only for ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia arrests. Additionally, be sure to titrate your inspiratory oxygen to the lowest amount needed to maintain an oxygen saturation of greater than 95% in order to prevent the formation of reactive oxygen species. This concludes part two of the cardio resuscitation module.